Dr. Timothy Olweni is a Secretary General of the Kenya Association of Private Hospitals. He's been here before he's back. Dr. Tari, good morning. Thank you. Thanks for welcoming me back. Good to have you in the show. Welcome again to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. How is Nakuru? Nakuru is, 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 is great. Yeah? Yes. It's doing well? Yes. Nakuru yeah. City, please. Uh, oh, yes. Eric. Yeah, you Nakuru better City. recognize that. People get these things right. Huh? Okay. Nakuru City? City. Okay. Okay. <laughs> How's Nakuru City? <laughs> We're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Doctor, you're here because as the, the Association of Private Hospitals and, of course, um, people in the healthcare space, you're really concerned about what the government thinks and plans for the sector. And not just, you know, the plight of <coughs> doctors and, you know, how much they're paid and who manages them, but access to healthcare services for everybody. Manifestos have been launched, four of them by the pre presidential candidates, more than 47 by gubernatorial candidates. They are all telling us things. Health is devolved, and that's why I'm bringing in the governors as well. From what we hear, let's look at the top level. William Ruto has pledged... Uh, NHIF compulsory, build uh, more level six hospitals, make sure that people have greater access to health services. Uh, Raila Odinga has said, Baba Care, similar, make, uh, make it easier and accessible for people to get access to healthcare services. You know, health is a big challenge. In fact, we'll increase the budgetary allocation to health, this, this, and the other. You have interrogated the manifestos, I believe. Yes, I have. Okay, take us through them. Um, thanks again for welcoming me to, to my favorite show. Mm -hmm. um, as you say, we've got, uh, I'll, I'll concentrate mainly on the ones for the presidential candidates because they are few enough to interrogate in a session like this. Yes. Um, for starters, I think it is important for us to analyze manifestos for two reasons. If it is important enough, chances are they will think about it. First of all, they'll mention it and they'll think about it. So in general, actually, almost all the presidential candidates have got uh, health as part of their manifestos and the integral part. You might say it is some of the, for some of them it's just purely because it is a standard uh, component of manifestos. Mm. Now, starting with that for the Agano party, I'll start with the ones that uh, will, will take less time. Mm -hmm. um, the Agano party, I must admit there are two parties, the Agano party and the Roots party. I even had difficulty getting a copy of the manifestos, the manifestos other than through the media mm -hmm. um but for the agano party they say they roll out universal health coverage and they give priority to cancer patients accident ventives and all forms of medical and non-elective surgery mm. first of all there are some misnomers in there but i'll not go into those details <laughs> the radical the radical thing that they propose mm. is that they will waive medical bills for any person who dies in a government hospital <laughs> Okay. And then for any persons above 70 years, they'll access to, to get access to free medical service. Okay. Um, there's not sufficient uh, detail thereafter to be able to interrogate that further. Th those are the statements they put out. The Roots Party Manifesto is, of course, one that has attracted much more attention, but I, I don't think there's necessarily a health component to it, mm. save for the aspect about marijuana and a possible... Um, medical, you know, solution Angle. or medical benefits, mm. but pr the marijuana proposal is lit is is more an it's more more economic. An economic perspective. Mm. So that's all that we have for the for the two for the two parties. Mm. Um, when it comes to the other parties, I think it is important to interrogate uh, these uh, manifestos with with a view to first of all, do they identify the healthcare system challenges we have correctly? Mm -hmm. And that's what's important for us in association because as we're looking at the healthcare system in general, having been in this space for a while, we know what challenges there are. And we, we, even think, we think we know what proposed fixes will work and what will not. Mm. Then after they've identified those problems, do they have solutions? And is the underpinning logic sound? Mm. Is it one of those that is persuasive enough that you think it's going to be a solution that works? Then there's the idea of ideological al alignment. That is important because if it aligns with what their broad policy is, it is more likely to be executed. Uh -huh. As an example, for example, you know, the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto has got more of an, in fact, there's an economic transformation agenda. That's what even uh, the, the manifesto is titled as. So they look at health as an enabler of that, of that economic transformation. In mm. as far as, of course, it is logical to say that 
that uh, a healthy nation, you have to have a healthy nation for you to be economically productive. Yes. So we're looking at health not, not as an end to itself, but as a means to an end, which I don't necessarily know whether that is strictly speaking correct, but at the very least, if we are healthy, mm. we, we, are, we, are, we are in a better place. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> for Azimio, I did not find too much coherence in terms of where they, in terms of the health space, there are a lot of statements that they have put out. Mm. I remember uh, watching on a TV show in one of your TV stations the other day. They, are, they seem to have come up a, a, a pretty uh, academic argument as mm. to how much detail you need to have in manifestos. And depending on which side you could see the, the, the panelists lay, yeah. some people said there's too much detail in this manifesto. That is not for a manifesto. A manifesto is a statement of intent. Uh -huh. So all you need to do is put out the. But other people will argue and say, if you don't tell us how you're going to do it, how do we then how do we believe do it? it? Mm. Of course, there's also the issue of whether whether these manifesto, manifestos there's a prospective versus a retrospective issue. Uh -huh. Anybody who has been an incumbent, of course, is going to be judged based on what they've done. That's where the footprints issue comes in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether if you are a prospective, there might not be a footprint. Of course, it depends on what position you've held to be failed before. Mm. But if it's a prospective issue, retrospective policy issues are, bo are more believable and more likely to influence voters. Mm. Because people say based on the track record, we either expect they will do it or they mm. will not. Mm. On the other hand, especially in Africa, I think, people don't tend to believe a lot of prospective social issues and because they, they don't think, first of all, they are financially feasible. So at the end of the day, you find whatever determines how voters, people vote is very different. Mm. However, in Kenya, we have a very interesting situation where we have a, a person who should have been running as an incumbent, having been in government for a while, mm. literally running as an opposition candidate. Yep. And an opposition candidate being the incumbent running almost as if he's an incumbent <laughs> so it is a very interesting <laughs> scenario but that is that is kenya for us it's a good thing <laughs> because it means that we have two incumbents mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. so when you're looking at all those issues then we are also looking at what their track record would be yes based on the positions of influence that they've held not necessarily positions of, of power but positions of influence mm. so if let's start with what what you started with earlier um the Kenya Kwanzaa. Yes. Kenya Kwanzaa promises on healthcare. Yes. What are the main things that Kenya Kwanzaa is promising? Firstly, they talk about, in fact, both manifestos men mention universal health coverage. Yes. Universal health coverage is an, is an aspirational goal mm. because when you look at even WHA's definition of health, <laughs> it is not it's something that is almost unattainable. When we talk about a state of complete mental, physical, and social well-being. It's aspirational. It's aspirational. Yeah. Because I don't think that any of us who can say at any one time, they are in that, in that state. And I, I remember a joke by Dr. Frank Jenga, who, when he was teaching me med school, he said that especially when you get to the age of 50, if in the morning you don't feel any pain anywhere, be very careful. You must, you must be dead. You must be dead. <laughs> check, your, check your address. <laughs> Come be on the other side. So, so <laughs> we talk about universal health coverage. The challenge that I have, and I say I, I'm looking at the level of thought that has gone into this process, mm. and I'm looking behind that and also seeing what kind of people wrote this down. Mm. There are some, there's an error which, uh, a crucial error which the Azimio, um, uh, Manifesto mix. They talk about first in the first statement, statement under the covenant. They talk about universal quality health care for all. First of all, universal and for all. That is already tautology. Yes. <laughs> universal. So the thing is, you you actually need universal health coverage, and universal health coverage and universal health care are, are different. two different things. Actually, let's and that's the right. fundamental mistake they make in their let's, manifesto. Let's distinguish those two. Yes. Coverage and health and and care. And care. What is universal health coverage? Universal health coverage has got three main facets. Mm. It first talks about equitable access to all the entire range of medical services that an, an individual or a citizen needs. Okay. That is the first one. Secondly, this must be of sufficient quality to be effective. Mm. So, for example, you can talk about universal health care where everybody is accessing care. But if it's not of sufficient quality to be effective, it doesn't meet the threshold of, for of universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, there's an the aspect of financial risk protection. And financial risk protection means that people should not go, go endure financial hardship in accessing, accessing. medical services. Okay. Now, again, that is UHC. 
coverage. Yes. yes. Okay. Care is just in terms of provision. Care is or you, access. you go into the hospital and there's you, someone you can access the hospital and yes. there's someone you find there. That's what I say again on the Azimio Manifesto. Mm -hmm. This is a fundamental problem because they go further to say that they are going to upskill universal health coverage to universal health care. <laughs> universal health coverage is, 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 is what we are it's, aspiring it's, towards. <laughs> so you can't say you you're can't, going to upskill from that to something that is lower down Quisha. so what i'm so what i'm saying is i so it, it basically exposes some lack of understanding of what you are promising yes and if, if not if, like i said earlier yeah. if there isn't sufficient thought that goes into it possibly it's not as important sense. and therefore again it means in terms of implementation it might be a challenge there's something you mentioned it also brings into question the individuals who wrote it mm. because clearly popular phrases that seem to indicate health for everyone when they like it when they need it and when they they can have it and yet an expert in the field would have told you uh that means this and this means that and it's not as though the expert needed to have written it the expert just needed to have been consulted yeah. and they would have informed you mm. now if you're talking about a specialty field like health and what you're offering already is looking like the cart is clearly before the horse then uh you're in a bit of a pickle wouldn't you say okay that's in the <laughs> definitions of the things that they're saying yes okay yes and then they go into specific things that they're pledging yes let's look at them in terms of as in this. Uh -huh. and especially if we're talking about uhc as a as, as a the pillar mm. there's mention which is right uhc and uh, especially health as a driver of economic growth in the azimio um in the azimio Manife manifesto mm. there's also a a, a a mention about poverty alleviation poverty alleviation in itself but uh in, and this i'll say even even the kenya kwanza manifesto doesn't mention mm. there's a very direct link relationship between poverty and ill health yeah and the, they, we also have to mention that there's bidirectional causality. In other words, one causes the other and the other. So, the for other example, the other. yes. So, mm -hmm. you've got ill health, it can drive you to poverty. When you're poor, you're more at risk of ill health. Mm -hmm. So, that is important because once you understand it. Now, the advantage for Kenya Kwanzaa on this one also is that given that the economic agenda is, is the main issue, you can see how they have got, first of all, the issue of poverty is more substantively addressed mm. and the issue of the with a link to economic empowerment of the of the, of the nation so that is important the other issue that we have mm. and which i think is extremely important is when you talk about uhc as a vehicle mm. uhc it's important for you to say how are you going to achieve it because we have talked about it and we've already made some steps in that direction so um always sometimes you find and especially if you've got a, if we had an incumbent for example running the tendency would be to continue in that same thing people who are running as opposition candidates would be more likely to propose radical changes mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of operationalizing it is important that first of all we have got the issue of equity and there are such glaring regional disparities in terms of the distribution of resources healthcare resources in this country mm -hmm. both in terms of human resources for health in terms of the healthcare density mm -hmm. healthcare facility density and also in terms of just the the things that you need to be able to run 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 healthcare services so that disparity is there and that is addressed again more substantively by the kenya kwanza manifesto how in terms of they're saying they want to reduce regional disparities in terms of distribution now there's also one key thing about human resources for health mm. there has been a very sticky issue since devolution came it was implemented by the the health human uh, health healthcare workers mm. the issue of devolution and there's been the push towards the health services commission yeah it is something that is difficult uh, it's a tough nut to crack because uh, you already devolve these services those functions are reside with the counties yeah the healthcare workers are saying just like the teachers have got a centralized a centralized employer that seems to work very well and there seems to be because i think that the counties just didn't have the the, the capacity to be able to humble, handle the hr needs of the workers but how do you reverse that there are constitutional uh, legislative issues that would have to be addressed how do you address that without being seen as being anti-devolution mm. which both candidates at least the leading candidates want to be seen as being pro pro devolution so <laughs> i think this is an issue that the kenya kwanza coalition has addressed to the extent 
only to the extent that they have said we are willing to have they dialogue are, about it. They are willing to entertain to the conversation. Dialogue. And they have said within 100 days, they have as mediators. Yes, as mediators mm. in that process. Mm. So they have not gone as far as promising that they are going to fix, but they have said they will mediate and see if there are any solutions that can be found. What is that? So the, the, like you've said, the argument by healthcare workers mm. is that you want to be managed nationally mm -hmm. and for various reasons, for, you know, promotion, for transfers, for placement, for all these things. Yes. But the drafters of the constitution knew that mm. every county will have its unique HR needs mm -hmm. and that that's why they created two boards per county. Mm. One, a county public service board, mm. and the other one, a county assembly mm -hmm. service board. Yes. So, if you have a county public service board, and it's dealing with all HR needs of the county mm. government, what's the issue? I, I don't know. Possibly <laughs> on paper it is meant to work. In <laughs> practice, it doesn't. It is just not working. And but is it working for the other cadres of workers in the county? But I tell you, more importantly, can it actually work? What? A county public service board? No, mm. you see, it's not just the county board. Mm. You have a system which is supposed to have a mandate that produces certain desired results. Mm. And I'm asking the question, can they work? And if not, what needs to be tweaked for them to work? In terms of you saying the county arrangement that we have yes, to involve the yes, arrangement. Yes, mm. yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I will not say, because I'm not, a, I don't work in the public service system. Mm. I say this from hearing what colleagues have said and what has been discussed in various forums. Mm. But one thing that I do know for a fact is it is not working. And if you look at the level of industrial unrest we've had since we had devolution, in terms of the number of strikes, in terms of the labor disputes, and so on, it is evidence that there is a serious problem in that space. Okay. Yes. Why well, I ask the question is because mm. if you look at the private sector <coughs> in the healthcare industry in this country, would you then say that the success or failures, if there are any, in the private sector have a direct correlation to what is clearly an absurd mismanagement of the health sector in the public domain? It, it could contribute. And even, even before we had the devolution of services, of course, even then the private sector had got certain efficiencies in the system, which is what makes it attractive mm. for the public to be able to access health care service in the public, in the private health care system. You know why I ask mm. is, remember, mm. the public health care system has not always been the way it is now. Mm -hmm. There have been times when it, it works yes. fairly well. Yes. But the deterioration has been immense, especially with the devolution. We've seemed to have gone from bad to worse. Just the human resource unrest, the industrial action and what have you, speaks volumes. Because these are the people who work in that industry. Now, I ask this question not because I think that there's a ready or an easy solution, but what is it then that the sort of efficiencies that we see in the private sector, because this is where the problem is, how do you then get to a point where these can be transferred? And if they can be, are there any candidates who've addressed this? Because talking about the things they're going to do, throwing figures at it, that is easy to do. But actually <laughs> understanding the problem and saying this is how we want to resolve it. I think they, we won't go, they've only gone to the extent of listening, but there are no immediate solutions. There are no solutions that are apparent in any of the manifestos. Then it's clear that they've all failed in that respect because the problem of healthcare in this country is something that dogs us every single day. And you cannot tell me that somebody wants to vie, wants to be the president of this country, and this thing that bothers people on a daily basis, the solution you want to provide is either throwing huge amounts at it or saying you're going to talk about it. That's what the unions have been doing for the longest time. <laughs> and that's why you're a secretary general. <laughs> if there were no problems, you probably wouldn't have your job. <laughs> no, me, I'm not of the, of the unions for workers <laughs> in the public sector. It's an association. My association of private hospitals. Believe me, it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's a, a union, union of private hospitals. <laughs> yes, believe me, it's a union. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, beyond making uh, general statements of saying they want to improve the working conditions of healthcare workers mm -hmm. and possibly their remuneration and so on, there is no immediate uh, solution that is... Uh, so on a scale of 1 to 10, what would we give them? On this particular... Oh, aspect, yes, health. On this, but oh, on, on health in general. Yes. What? You can segment and say, Azimio, this, Kenya Kwanzaa, the other two gentlemen... 
I was hoping you wouldn't put me on the spot in terms of giving a reason. We'll conclude with that. <laughs> Let's go through everything. <laughs> we'll even ask the public to, to help us do that. <laughs> and then okay. at the end, mm. we start scoring <laughs> and giving them marks. Let's take a break. It's okay. half past nine. <laughs> Kenya's biggest conversation. Dr. Timothy Oloeni is the Secretary General of the Kenya Association of Private Hospitals. We are talking about the various presidential manifesto and what they are promising with regards to healthcare. Are they giving us any tangible promises? Are they likely, who's likely to deliver on the promise that they've made on paper? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Conversation continues right. with Dr. Timothy Oloeni, the Secretary General of the Kenya Association of Private Hospitals, looking at the different manifestos and what they're promising. So some appear to have put a little bit more thought into the issue of healthcare. Others appear to just have copy pasted and just put in words here and there. And pro is there any of them that is actually solid that is saying this is what we are going to do? And just looking at it, you can see if they implemented what they have written 100%, they would actually move us somewhere. Yes. Well, and I'll give an example. For example, the emergency medical fund. There's been a huge debate, uh, especially since we enacted the the not so new 2010 constitution now oh, mm. and we talked about the right to health care and especially and that includes emergency medical services mm. there has been a question about who foots the bill for that who is the addressee of this health rights claims yes in other words it can't be at the expense of for example private health care providers like us so much as we're constitutionally bound and legally bound to provide emergency services it was proposed in the 2017 there was a health act that said you set up a fund and you operationalize it so that we can be able to disburse funds for those circumstances. This has never been done since then. Mm -hmm. The Azimio um, manifesto so. comes out clearly and says they are going to operationalize it and set it up. That is important. The, uh, the Kenya Kwanzaa manifesto kind of calls it something else, mm -hmm. but also kind of proposes the same thing. So this is basically a fund mm -hmm. which is getting money from the exchequer yes. to go to assist those who may be unable to pay. Yes. And whether it's for emergency services, mm -hmm. not for everything, yes. emergency. So yes. you're picked up in an, by the roadside after mm -hmm. an accident yes. and you're taking someone, you need to be uh, treated immediately. Yes. Someone will pay that. Yes. A public or private facility. Yes. And this is the exchequer. Yes. Okay. So in, in, in that, that is important. In time, the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto, they talk about introducing a new levy mm. uh, or funding it directly from government. Mm. But regardless of how this is set up, that is something we need like yesterday because it is also going to encourage, mm. especially people who are private healthcare providers to provide that service, provide it freely. And for example, one and of the things- stop, And to stop denying service. Um, no, that we're not denying. No, I know it. Okay, let me, yeah. let, let's on a serious note, yes. I know on occasions it happens. Yes. It is not something that we can condone. It is not something that is legal. Mm. It is something that we are bound to do. But the key thing is also that the, there has to be somebody to pay for it. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying, operation, operationalization of this fund is extremely important. It will also encourage people to go and assist people who are accident scenes, for example. People evacuate people from different locations because the challenge you have now is you've got providers, if you do, go and be the good Samaritan and evacuate people, it's at your expense. You're a first responder and then you're told it's your, it's your responsibility. Yes. You want me to admit this person put in a deposit in our life. Yes. Okay. Then there's also the issue that I think is important in any discussion about UHC. We have to talk about what vehicles we're going to use for the real relation of this. Mm. I think NHIF has already taken center stage in terms of being the vehicle that has been chosen to help realize this. And NHIF reform has to be addressed substantively. Already we had some amendments to the act which were already operationalized. There's only one which is still controversial about the matching of contributions from employers, which is held up in court. Mm. But everything else is already is already um, legal and and, and in force as as we speak. Oh, but like, the, like compulsory contribution. Yes. Now there's the issue, and I think uh, NHIF reform is addressed uh, quite extensively by the Kenya Kwanzaa Coalition. The Azimio Coalition is silent on this, mm. but. They, so they've got a raft of proposals first to try and increase enrollment. There has been a challenge in terms of being able, for those who are in formal employment, mm. it is mandatory. You don't really have a choice and you get your pay net of that deduction. Yeah. So it is automatic. Mm. The challenge has always been the voluntary contributors. Mm. How do you handle that? Because you have got people who are going to contribute 
unfortunately, because of what we call adverse selection, when they perceive or they anticipate they're going to need care, they'll contribute exactly. for a few months. Then after they access the care, they will default again. Mm -hmm. And sometimes for understandable reasons. Times are hard. A lot of people just can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, they talk about people being, this This is, it becomes the vulnerable people. And the term indigets, I don't really like it. I, call, I prefer economically disadvantaged populations, people in the population. The government is supposed to contribute that for them. But how about the voluntary contributors who are not in formal employment? How do you enforce it? Mm -hmm. Making it mandatory is one thing. Enforcing it. Is a different thing altogether. It's a different animal. Because how are you going to start arresting people when they don't have an NHIF card? You tell them you look like... Uh, I think it's, it's, the, it's, bill, the bill was proposing denial of service for other government services. I know. You, you, you know, like, <laughs> you want to go and uh, do some land transfer and you told, ah, you're NHIF, my friend. No, the person who came up with that clearly didn't put sufficient thought into it. Mm. The reason I say this is, this carrot and stick approach has places where it works, but something as emotive and as essential as healthcare, a more persuasive approach will bear more fruit. Mm -hmm. You see, why is it that when decisions of this nature are made, someone looks for the sort of solution that starts with a threat? Not persuasion, mm. not inclusivity, threat. So now, the reaction then is also set. It's a threat. Okay. Yes. Mm. Let's see what they can do. Yes. As opposed to, Defiance. can <laughs> we find a way in which we can make this thing possible for you? Mm -hmm. Because all these intelligent people who come with these ridiculous decisions can actually put a little more thought into it and actually come up with something that can actually work. Because they're not, we're not asking them to go around the country and talk to every uh, individual of the 50 million people in Kenya. Mm -hmm. There are ways in which you reach people. There are ways in which you can <coughs> convince them. Mm -hmm. And when it's healthcare, what convincing do you need? People know they need healthcare. That's true. Dr. Lloyd, mm -hmm. what other reforms, because you say NHIF reforms need uh, a more comprehensive approach, that we have had the legal reform, what other reforms are needed in NHIF to operationalize UHC? Just to, just to, to comment on what CT was mentioning earlier first, mm. I think the key thing to show up enrollment is actually to deliver value. There's no two ways about it. Insurance, I keep saying, is about a promise. Mm. Mm. You are ensuring for an unforeseen event, if and when that event occurs, you better deliver on your promise. Mm. And that's the only way. For example, NHIF, when, when there, were, there were changes in, in the past and NHIF side opening outpatient services and they broadened the scope of the services they were delivering, there was an increase in terms of enrollment because people mm. all of a sudden say, wow, you mean I can actually go to a, a, a private facility, I can go to a government facility and mm. get service and not pay for it. Mm. But the challenge is in terms of trying to ram it down people's throats that say you just must be a member because we have said you'll be a member, it's not going to work. Mm. So in terms the of reforms. NHIF reforms, mm. we t you, you t we've already talked about the issue about and enhanced enrollment, but I think we just need a little more resourcefulness, especially in this re resource-constrained environment we live in, mm. in terms of how we're using those resources. Interestingly, the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto actually says this is a budget-neutral health manifesto, health segment. Mm. In other words, they're not planning, even promising to deploy any further resources. And that's why it becomes even much more important for us to use the resources we have, get get more mileage for the kind of investment that we are putting in. Mm. And that involves resources. There are certain things that we have in terms of waste, which we need to get rid of. For example, the efficiency at NHIF, I know it used to be a big challenge before it has significantly improved. Mm. But for example, you can't be having a significant amount of the contributions going to admi administrative costs. Mm. You cannot, you can have people contributing to have an organization they're contributing to run. Mm. It has to be that they're contributing and this is going towards healthcare. One of the radical things that is proposed in the Kenya Kwanzaa, or I'll say different, mm. they talk about having seamless universal health, uh, seamless health insurance, meaning that you've got both private and NHIF, but they propose a flip of what the current system is. At the moment, what the law says is that your private provider will take first loss. They're the ones who will pay for your bill first, and, and then, then after NHIF. that, NHIF kicks in. Mm. Kenya Kwanzaa are proposing the reverse, which says again that NHIF is the one that is going to pay first, which means technically NHIF is paying bills for everyone More. in the country, mm. and then, which I think is is not right. How because, does that work? Yeah. Yes. Because that is what we're trying to move away from. As a social health insurer, they need to kick in last. Mm. I think technically that is what it should be. Of course, there's an issue about 
people saying you're going to discriminate against me. Why are you not paying my bill purely because of because a I've ability to get bill. additional insurance and yet I'm the one who's paying a premium. Chances are those with private insurance are actually contributing more, especially if they're in formal employment. Mm. But those are issues that you can discuss back and forth. In general, what is important is for people to be able to have access and we have to pre-finance healthcare. In other words, people don't need to be paying for care at the point of service. Pay for it in advance so that when you need the service, you just access the service and the provider is paying for it's it. It's like any other insurance. You don't pay for your vehicle insurance the day you have an accident. Yes. Mm. No. Mm. It's anticipatory. Yes. You pay for it in advance. Yeah. If it doesn't happen, mm. well... Yes. Mm. And that's the, that's, that's the only way we can have that financial risk protection, which is one of the things in UHC, mm. that we make sure people don't go in, through financial hardship in terms of getting bills. There's an interesting article someone wrote a while ago about willing to sp willingness to pay and ability to pay. There are a lot of people, by the way, who are willing to pay. They are, and th the perception that they're able to pay comes from the fact that they go and sell, di di dispose of their assets. Yeah. For example, the, some, if somebody's a pastoralist and he goes has to dispose of half of his head mm. to be able to take care of medical bills, the presumption might be he's yeah. actually willing to, pay. willing to pay. But if you look at the cost of that mm. and going further down the road, what it means for his livelihood and his well-being, the truth is they were not able they to were not, They were not willing. Yes. They, were, they, they had to, they were made to pay yes kenya kwanza has also promised <coughs> to do something about the health workforce employing mm. more is it yes and and building level <coughs> six hospitals yes but does that address their needs in the health sector the truth of the matter is if you look at what who gives us recommendations in terms of the kind of facilities we have and, and the density the truth of the matter is we actually have a sufficient health facility density all right yeah to be able to provide the service we need. The challenge we have at the moment is about human resources and especially disparity in distribution mm. and then the health commodities, the things to be used in those facilities. Mm. You can have facilities that are open and you can be able to have personnel even present, but if they don't have the commodities to work with, that becomes that a challenge. Becomes an and especially in the current county arrangement, for example, where we're waiting for disbursement of funds from the national, the national order to come. The moment those delays come in, then you know there's delays in supplying commodities and then you get concerns then how is healthcare being delivered. Mm. So I, I would not necessarily say that would be an immediate priority. The right now it would be about using the assets we have. And secondly, the disparities. The other day I was, I listened to some people who, some a patient, a family who were talking about being diagnosed with chronic kidney failure. Mm. And if you analyze that based on the region they came from, they were being treated for ulcers where they were in the periphery. And you know, by the time they get, they had to come to KNH to get diagnosed and somebody says, wow, this is kidney failure. And then they were starting on dialysis and so on. But you understand that disparity. You could have the, some of the assets that we've, healthcare assets that have been deployed in that area. Yeah. But clearly something is not working mm. because, and especially for healthcare workers, the reason why we talk about this also problem about deployment in the regions and so on, one of the arguments for devolution was that we're going to now be able to deploy healthcare workers into, into the periphery. So one of the argue, wor worries that people have about centralizing this thing yeah. is again, people are going to be choosing and saying everybody wants to work in Nairobi mm. and Kiambu because Nairobi always tends to attract the bulk of all the healthcare personnel and the specialists. And that doesn't work for us as a country. So there's a lot of things that we need to think about critically in terms of being able to deploy our healthcare assets. But why is it that the preference is for Nairobi? It's because Nairobi has facilities. Yes. Nairo in Nairobi, you are guaranteed that you'll be able to work in an environment where your expertise can be put to very good use. Yes. Now, surely. And I also everything else. There yes. Are other social services are available. Yes. You have access to good school. You have access to a better roads. You have access to better housing. You have a larger number of able paying clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the question is, I would ask with the devolution, surely. Mm -hmm. Is it then not, should we say, simple logic that the very thing that people come to Nairobi for can be provided for within the county setting. That is what yeah. was envisaged, I think. But you but know, it can't just be a pill you swallow and then things happen. I mean, it's going to take time. For, Eric, I'm sure you'll tell me, Dr. Mm. younger doctors, when they graduate and they're sent out there, they're okay until they start starting families and you're thinking about your family and your entire totality of welfare yes and you're thinking no i cannot be working in capedo with my family so yes. i can't take my family to Cap yes. capedo i want my family somewhere in an urban setting in nairobi where they have access to good school they have access to hospital they have access to this and the other and that is one of the re reasons why 
that affects that distribution and the, the disparity caused. Yes. And but Eric, remember, uh -huh. the infrastructure that the county governments were building on, or infrastructure the central government had created in the first place. The question I would ask is, mm. what have they done to enhance that capacity since we got county government? Yes, so that is uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Yeah, but I'm agreeing with Eric in as far as that's one of the main reasons why you vote healthcare workers always gravitated around around urban areas and then you, and, and yet we've got the majority of our population in the periphery so you can see where we've got uh, a disparity we do but mm. then look at a different profession mm. teaching mm -hmm. the only thing that has made people run away from certain areas is insecurity, insecurity. precisely yes. but otherwise people seemed very willing and all these counties had civil servants who actually worked there yes without their families mm. It is usually without their families. And mm. the reason was the amenities you speak of did not exist. Mm. Now, the understanding is money has been provided so that some of these f facilities, even if it's basic, within these 10 years of devolution, there should have been some improvement so that the story we're talking about isn't the same. And we do have counties where, for instance, in the health sector, it is clear things have improved because of what they have done. Two counties in the northeast of this particular uh, country come to mind. But then again, why the difference is there, they're almost starting from zero. Because mm -hmm. what was available was at a very bare was minimum. Nothing. Okay. Yes, it, it was next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, it can't be that that is the excuse we use when we know that resources are expended every single year towards some of these things. And yet, the story is that we don't have them. And yet, the resources were expended. If these county governments could give us a clear account of how, which they never do anyway, mm. okay, this problem of health, which never seems to have a lasting solution, I'm certain some solution will have been found. Why do I say this? The very people who have private practice and who are private hospitals are Kenyans. They went to the same university as these are the people. Same. How is it that they are able to find a solution? Same. It isn't as though there's a training institution we want to work for government and those who want to go into the private sector. Mm. It's the same. So, the solution clearly exists. It does. It does. It does. As we conclude, Dr. Tari, there's a big issue about cancer. Oh, uh, stop giving cancer the monopoly. Oh, give cancer the monopoly, retain the monopoly. What's the issue with cancer? And what do you see as the future for cancer? I think cancer, as I, I think, as constituted the concept was excellent and unfortunately it seems to have been riddled with some i would say competing interests <laughs> muga is a little more seat he's a little more blunt than i am <laughs> i thought he was going to say corruption <laughs> competing interests <laughs> so but so i think it's just uh, if you were to ask me a lot of the institutions we have just need to run the way they were intended to run. Mm. I think it's an issue of just how we're running them. I don't even think we need to dismantle them as such. Mm. We just need to get the systems running the way they should. In fact, even in Kenya, Kwanzaa, one of the ways they want to address this CAMSA monopoly issue is they talk about setting up a, a stakeholder managed procurement uh, kind of organization. <laughs> mm. So what they say, for example, and if, for example, even with private hospitals and so on, we can procure in bulk. But this was more in, the, in light of the aspect of the rising cost of healthcare, mm. which is one of the things that none of the coalitions has really addressed. And that's why when I talk about using the resources we have to, to the maximum extent uh, to get the maximum benefit out of them, the rising cost of healthcare, that debate must be had and comprehensively so that we bring down the health But Dr. Yes. does CAMS actually have a monopoly? And if it's a monopoly, what monopoly do they have? <coughs> I know it is. I, it, they have a more monopoly of supplying to public hospitals, yes, don't they? Yes. Supplying. Mm -hmm. But are they the ones who actually source all these things and ensure that the public gets it? Or are there other people who are also involved in that process other than themselves? Yes. Take it to public facilities? Mm -hmm. Taking to public facilities, mm -hmm. they were given that mandate. Taking. And monopoly. And the reason is because mm -hmm. they had the network. PEPFA funding, because of ARVs and the like, helped the structuring of this organization to enable it to do this very same thing so that it could be available all over the country. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Supply to public mm. hospital, it makes sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when somebody says you then want to uh, dismantle it and create something, create what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, 
I anyway, think, I think uh, yesterday mm-hmm. in the in the town hall, I heard Ruto talking about something like an OTS for the oil marketing companies. So all of you suppliers, you bring in all your needs. I mean, all you facilities bring all your needs together, and then we jointly procure from bulk, bulk yes. in bulk. So it ensures that the public one, Kemsa, plus all the other privates are all competing and mm. bidding. And nope. the one with the lowest bid. That's given. <laughs> <laughs> Let's conclude the conversation, Dr. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. As we talk about all this, uh, we also remember, remind ourselves about election bill norma, which is, let's go into this poll. Let's avoid any form of violence. I'm sure you can tell us in a word or two, the burden of violence to the health system. Yes. Mm. Um, I'll give an example in 2007. And I'm talking about being in Nakuru at that time. When post-election violence broke out, for the first time in this country, we had wards that were, were segregated based on party affiliation and ethnic origin. Wards? Yes, as opposed to gender, which is the usual or age where you talk about pediatric wards and so on. It, it got as bad as you, would, you will not have sudden, a surgeon from a certain ethnic group or an anesthesiologist from a certain ethnic group uh, take care of you. There's a patient who told me once, come and tamalizwa, watch an imalizwa nikiona. Wow. They are not going to go into theater. And that just tells you the level of animosity, the level of mistrust which we got. Talking about again violence, and I go back to the issue again of emergency, medical funds. You can imagine in those circumstances, Spice the number of life. people whom we took, took care of, all right? People come in with all manner of injuries and there's even no time to query or discuss how is this going to get paid for you take care of it mm. but the truth is we were left holding the bill so just to re-emphasize what you have said we cannot go down that road again and, and at the end of the day someone made a, I, I read a phrase the other day where they said that politics is the art of guising your personal aspirations as public interest oh. at the end of the day we have to we have to focus on the fact that kenya is going to be there after the truth is life is going to go on and regardless who wins who wins this election the truth of the matter is short of interrogating and holding them to account as to what their policies were and telling them hey your manifesto here are you delivering on it that's what's important but all the other issues that we seem to seem to worry about not important. Not important. Yes. Very well put. Dr. Timothy Olweni, Secretary General of the Kenya Association of Private Hospitals. Thank you for coming. And as usual, the door is open. Karibu tena. Thank you Natana. very much.